Hello everyone, my name is Alessandro and this is the Temple of Surf, the podcast will give you full access to the best surfers, skaters, shapers, surfboard collectors, shop owners in the world. Discover with me their stories, the greatest successes, amazing behind the scenes and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to the 17th episode of the 5th series of the Temple of Surf, the podcast. Today with us is legendary shaper Chris Christensen to discover more about shaping surfboard, surf and much more. Hi Chris and welcome to the show. Where are you today? Uh, Currently I'm in Florida at the Ricky Carroll Surfboard Factory. So today I would like to talk to you, to you about many things uh, and, uh, uh, of course, shaping, surfing. But the first question I ask everybody, in your opinion, what is the most important thing in surfing? Having fun. As simple as that, right? I mean, surfing is an emotion, right? Like we do things because emotion and emotions are how we feel. So it's like, you know, surfing, if it makes you feel good, then you're having fun and it's important and it's healthy with anything in life, you know? It's yeah. just, to me, everything I decide on doing is based on emotion. So no matter what I do. It's, it's a so simple concept, but it's not that easy to, to put in place. You know, a lot of uh, surfing. No, it's not. No, yeah, you got to, to have good emotions. You got to be healthy physically and mentally. You know, there's so many people that suffer with mental illnesses and, and same as physical illnesses. So it's... You know, at the end of the day, it's all about taking care of yourself, getting good sleep, exercising, eating well. And it just then, then that correlates by, you know, making all your passions that much more enjoyable, whether it be surfing or anything you're into. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, uh, surf is also healing sometimes, right? If you think about uh, uh, what... Uh, what certain foundation like uh, now if i remind um, the paskovic foundation for people with autism you know and uh, what surf is able to do with uh, uh, with with them is is amazing you know it's very powerful to be in the element of water as well yeah it's um you know it's it's important it's why i do it and you think about it, you know, with through the COVID situations and all that, there's so many more surfers. And it's why uh, surfer chippers are so busy now. You know, there's not enough of the supply chain to meet the demand. But I think through COVID, people finally, you know, slowed down from their daily rat race. And they're getting oars out the door. It's an industry. is going, you know, it's going bonkers right now. It's hard to buy a tent. It's hard to buy a sleeping bag. Hiking uh, poles, hiking shoes, surfboard poles, everything. So, I, and that part of COVID has been good. And I'm not talking about business level. I'm just talking about people's personal health and, and, you know, getting after something and enjoying something. And, you know, that's why I do what I do. You know, sometimes I struggle with, oh, I'm just a toy maker. I'm just making surfboards, you know, and, you know, it get, gets stale sometimes. But in the last few years, I've kind of enjoyed it more than ever because at the end of the day, my job is to put a smile on a grown-up's face. And if I'm doing that, then I think I'm doing a good job. Definitely, definitely. And uh, yes, you know, we all uh, suffer from the, the fact that uh, the industry of um, surfing is uh, and shipping is uh, booming right now. And for us surfers in Europe, let's say, it's very difficult to get uh, surfboards from from US. And maybe that was a, a positive thing in uh, that COVID bre- brought, uh, definitely. But uh, as you said, it is most important that the fact that people started to go out again and live uh, uh, their life uh, like it should have been, you know, maybe less fast than before and more meaningful. So I, I don't know if for everybody is like that, but uh, I guess I hope for, 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 for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm very curious. I have a lot of questions for you. I'll try to make it uh, uh, fast, but I'm very curious about the 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 last uh, uh, board uh, show, right? You participated okay. uh, the homage of uh, Pat Rosen. Uh, can yeah. you tell me more about that as you experience like uh, live 
uh, this uh, this important event. I mean, uh, already Pat Rosen is a legend, but uh, not only him. You know, like Dick Brewer and a lot of shepherds from uh, from from US, from my wife uh, were there. How did it go? Uh, how was it this year? Um, I think this year is one of the better years. The shape up is actually my concept. Scott Bass, who produces a boardroom show. Him and I were in Australia about ooh, 12, it was about 2007, somewhere around there. And him and I were in Australia together for about two weeks. And he, he was mentioning this boardroom show that he was getting ready to put together. I think the first one was in 2010, 2009, somewhere around there. But anyways, he brought up like, yeah, I want to do live shaping. And I go, I'd you know, rather do a shaping contest. And he's like, well, come up with something if you got something on mind. So the shape off is actually my something that I came up with years ago. And the whole concept started with let's dedicate it to one of the masters currently or in the past or whatever. So the very first one was to Mike Diffender for Diffender for because he was my favorite shaper of all time and a lot of favorite shapers. And so we got to do that. And and the concept was is to the first ones were. We divided up by regions. We have Southern California, Central California, Northern California, East Coast, Hawaii, Australia. And the first ones, the shapers in those areas voted who they wanted to represent their area. So whoever got the most votes was a shaper for instance, for San Diego, Orange County, LA, da, 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 East Coast, whatever. So that's how the first one started. And then to keep the judging um, fair, the shapers were given a code, like a triangle, a square, an X. And so the, the judges didn't shape it. Each shaper gets five minutes to spend with the board. And you're given a template. And everyone gets the same blank. And then you got 90 minutes to shape it. And the overall thing is whoever does the best job uh, wins. And then there's a perpetual trophy. Now it's kind of evolved into a man-on-man kind of heat. So now you got, you got one round, a quarterfinal, semifinal, and a final. And each key is a different board. And now the shapers that the, that uh, we choose, because the first year, different for you know, he passed away already, so he wasn't able to choose. So now the shapers that are chosen as honoree get to choose who they want in the contest. Um, and then whoever wins the previous one keeps going. So... So like, you know, Ryan Birch won yeah. this year and he gets to go again next year. And actually he won last year too. Um, Ricky Carroll has the most wins out of anyone. I think he has six. He's from the East Coast. It's actually the factory I'm at right now in Florida. I come out here about every six weeks to shape. Anyways, um, so yeah, I've done a few of them. I won one year when it, they're, uh, the year that they're, um, Matt Bielus was on okay. Um, That was one I won that one. I competed in the caster one. I competed in the rusty one. And then Ross and I've judged before too. Dick Brewer was always one of my mentors. And obviously I couldn't, you know, I worked with Dick Brewer for so long. So I couldn't compete in that one. So I judged with Dick Brewer. And that year Pat Rawson won. So that was in 2012. So anyways, this year, yeah, it was an honor to be chosen by Pat. My first seat, I had word copy. I mean, anyone could have won this thing. It was but uh, even the judges said it was the hardest one to judge out of all the contests um and then i so yeah i had word coffee in my first seat then i went up against timmy patterson who i had picked to win it honestly i like i think this is uh, hey i was kind of like leaning towards timmy patterson or bill barnfield um but anyways timmy patterson got me in the semifinal and went on <laughs> to ryan birch and ryan birch took out uh took out timmy patterson and i'm stoked for ryan and and you know ryan and i are from the same town um okay. it's been neat to see ryan evolve very fast over the years, you know, obviously he's an amazing surfer and his shaping talents are, uh, congruent to his surfing talents. And he's, 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 he's someone very special. It's, it's, he's, he's an asset to surfing. Um, he's humble and, um, yeah, I'm proud that he's from San Diego. So it's, I'm still, I'm super stoked for him. Thank you for sharing the behind the scene of, uh, of this contest. Yeah. I, I, I was not uh, aware. And you know, definitely, it's like uh, um, you know to see all these uh, uh, legends and current uh, shapers all yeah. in the same room is something uh, amazing, challenging each other, but in a positive spirit, right? So at the end, yeah, 
And then the next one, you know, I don't know who they're they're choosing to be the next honoree. Uh, uh, I'll be honest, who I, you know, Scott always asks me, he, you know, he reaches out to me like, hey, who do you think's next? Who do you think's next? And I actually chose Xanadu for the next one because I, I he to this day he's my favorite performance shortboard shaper. And if you go back to like 1990, 1991, 1992, that was a pivotal year of surfing, you know, when the boards started getting the flip noses, the flip tails, and the rockers, the air game and is the incipient stages of the momentum generation for Taylor Steele and, and Xanadu was at the forefront of that design with Brad Gerlach and Donovan Frank and Ryder and a handful of other guys at the time. And all the way down to his fans. I mean, his boards were really ahead of the curve. So I think he was the guy that really took 80s surfing to 90s surfing and 90s, 90s surfing. Like he was, I think he was the main guy in that pivotal change in the performance surfing. So anyways, he's my pick for the next one. And obviously there's a long list of so many shapers that deserve to be honored on they go on and on and on. So anyways, um, hopefully one day he does get picked it because I think he deserves it. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, uh, you as a as a as a shaper. Uh, when did you start? Of course, uh, I you you said it yourself. You you had the opportunity to learn as well from uh, Dick Brewer, so from a uh, great great master. Uh, when when was uh, the the year? Which, which year was that when you started to to shape? I started shaping in nineteen August of nineteen ninety two. I was going to school down in Point Loma. Uh, university at Point Loma in uh, San Diego. And I uh, actually going to school with John Wagner, another fellow shaper. And him and I used to rent a shaping room from Rich Pavel. His shaping studios were just down the street from the university. John Wagner and I were going. So him and I shared a room. And that's where Dick Brewer would come to shape when he was in California. He shaped in California often. So that's how I initially got to meet Dick Brewer as he saw what I was doing. And, you know, I just come in after class and wiggle away on blanks and everything was handshake back then, obviously. And um, developed a friendship with him and his manager, Paul Kelly. Paul Kelly had a big part in um, getting me involved with Dick Brewer and, and a lot of other things in surfboards and, and Rich Favelle, too. And so that's how I, get, I led on to starting to work with Dick Brewer. I ended up working with him for like eight years, uh, shadow shaping, roughing, finishing. Etc. We even then we even uh, after I graduated college, Dick Brewer and I got our own factory together in Ocean oh. Beach, Ocean Ocean Beach, San Diego. We had that for about four years or so. It was kind of short lived, and then uh, I went on to work in a couple other different glass shops that had shaping rooms and I had glass to doing production glassing and. Then from there, I got my own little factory in this area of Bay Park, San Diego. And that's when Skip Fry was moving out of this place to Pacific Beach. I got a, a second building that I was going to build a glass shop in. And then I got scared. And then I saw Skip Fry was leaving his place. <laughs> and so I, I was too scared to expand. So I called, I went over to Skip and his wife, talked to him. I said, hey, I got this extra building. I was going to build my factory, but I'm kind of scared. I, I don't think I'm quite ready for that growth. And I know you guys are looking for a place because it's real hard to find industrial space in San Diego. And I looked at it and then they took it. So then for probably 10 years, thought as far as, you know, shaping mentors, I, I can't even imagine a better way to do it. You know, starting out, yeah. you know, being around Rich Bedell and then Dick Brewer and then Skip Fry. Never worked for Skip Fry. Skip Fry has always done his own boards, which is killer. But just osmosis, being next to him, uh, lifestyle, surfing together, et cetera. Um, really good experience. And then I was living in Cardiff, which is a half hour north. And then after about 10 years of that, I just finally decided like, hey, I'm gonna be a, I need to have a factory in North County closer to home because I was driving 45 minutes each way to work. It was getting old. Then all these other shapers kind of came into this little thing where I had with Skip Ryan and I now, you know, then Josh Hall was there and then Michael Miller and now uh, Bob Mitzfin and <laughs> Hank Warner's there. There's this like this crazy, Crazy <laughs> shape commune that that started off from me just being a little rat right out of college, and, and twenty something years later, it's like a full shaping commune. 
<laughs> it's amazing that uh, you know, like uh, uh, all of uh, you, you are closer together. You know, like your neighbor neighborhood, and but you are. I mean, very important name, you know, being a neighbor of uh, Skip Fry is uh, it's something is something quite relevant, you know, if we talk about uh, shaping industry and, and shapers, right? So uh, Yeah, and he had the biggest influence on rail designs for me. Like, I, I was always a big fan of Dick Brewer outlines and then Mike Diffender for rails and Skip Fry rails. And the rails are that low apex rail. So I might, I kind of make, my rails are kind of a blend of fries and different differs. Not as not as sharp as skips, but not as dull as diffs. But you know, right in the middle, that's kind of what I've come up with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you had to, as a, if I if I ask you, what what is the best teaching that you got from uh, from Dick Brewer, from um, all the other names that we said so far uh, that influence you, influence your shape? <clears throat> What what was the best teaching that you can conserve till to still today? You know, there's never neither one of them had any hands-on ap- approaches with me. I was always just a very curious, perceptive type. You know, I was always real shy, so I was always the kind of guy that would just you know kind of like mm-hmm. sneak in and then watch and then oh and then you know and everything was just kind of through eyes and through touch. So those were the best teachings is was their finished work, you know, and then I just study it, study it, study it. Like it was a, like it was an exam for a final in college. So, and both had completely different lifestyles, which was interesting too, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways I wanted to be like those guys. And there's a lot of ways I didn't want to be like them at all too. So, you know, it, it just, it, it was cool. Cause it, I still was able to develop into my own person and not kind of, and, and, and my own shaper, you know, my own designs, et cetera. I, I don't like to be overly influenced by, you know, too many people at once or, or any one person, really. I just hope I can always, when I, when I go into design a board and stuff like that, and when I want to get creative, I actually go to my cabin in the mountains. I don't, I won't look at surfboards. I won't look at magazines. I won't watch surf videos or anything. I don't want any outside influence. I won't go to a surf shop and touch board to just... I try to shut it off like a month before I go into new designs. And then I just go somewhere that's irrelevant to surfing, like the mountains and get in the woods. And then that's how I come up with most of my designs and, and when I can get most creative. Yeah. But I guess, you know, like, uh, obviously you create new designs because you learn, you have a base, right? And that base most yeah. has been influenced by, by, by you ever teach you right at that time exactly yeah and, and then on that base you evolve and you do your own so it's uh yeah it's quite uh quite quite relevant then i i like the fact that you go to the mountains for for creating new shapes that's a quite interesting approach right <laughs> yeah I, I actually have a i have a i have a cabin in the mountains out my sticks i actually filmed the very first indiana jones for my property Okay. Uh, back in 83 or 82 um and anyways um the house actually burned down five years ago and i had to rebuild it from a wildfire oh wow and so when i redesigned the new house it's on a hill so i was able to build a, a, a work studio underneath it so i have a shaping room uh at my cabin so i actually do quite a bit of work up there because i love snowboarding and i'm up there a lot in the winter time so i get a lot of work done up there okay <laughs> We started this interview saying what is the most important thing in surfing, and we said having fun, of course. Uh, what is the most important thing in shaping, in your opinion? The rail, the rail, the rail, right? It's all um, about the rail. It's all about the rail, and as you said, like uh, uh, Skip Fry was the kind, the the guy that perfected right rails. Uh, Improvement. Yeah. Actually, not only him, right? Quite, if you think about it, quite, uh, quite a lot of other shapers. But this is what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Skip Fry and Mike Diffender were my biggest rail influences for sure. Okay. Um, today, uh, let's talk about um, shaping and innovation. Right? Uh, there is quite a lot to say, uh, but I would like to see it how do you leave it right uh, which kind of innovation are you trying to bring to 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 your surfboard of course there is the design 
still innovates and change and that. But uh, materials, maybe, I, I don't know. How do you live in, in, in that? Um, you know, obviously, we're all influenced by the past. So, you know, there, I haven't seen any too many shapers reinvent the wheel or do, no. do anything I haven't seen before. Um, you know, even the asymmetrical thing and all that, it's all been done for the last 40 years. So for me is, you know, my goal is to try to keep things timeless. Um, you know, you look at the clothing industries and all that stuff, and they're always changing the designs every season. There's a spring collection, summer collection, fall collection, winter collection, all that bullshit. Um, and I see even a lot of like the performance brands are constantly changing their models. And it's like this model, that model, they all look the fucking same and same tails, like the different name. I just try to keep it timeless, but yeah, still progressive. You know what I mean? I don't like, you know, when people see a Kilfin fish, like, oh yeah, well, one of your retro fishes. And I just want to fucking slap them. You know, I'm like, don't say retro. <laughs> like, I hate that. Like. Like, I've been riding keelfin fish since mid nineties, and you know, I rode them all over the place, North Shore, everywhere. Like it's 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 a timeless design. It's a high performance board, and it's just a different tool. You know, it's like it's like music. You know, it's just a different feel, different vibes, different flow. You know, I, there's a lot of boards in my line where I try to make them. You know, and I give them the customer. I'm like, hey man, this thing should last for twenty years, or give it to your grandkids. It's still gonna work. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to put good integrity into the quality and the time that goes into it. And there's a lot of my boards I don't even put logos on um, just because of that. Like, you know, I'll make it. I'm like, wow, this is a 20 year board or 30 year board, whatever. But I don't want some dated logo on it. You know, sometimes logos can really ruin a t shirt, anything, you know, like, oh, God, that looks so 80s or that looks so 70s or 90s, whatever. Like, but if it doesn't have a logo on it, it, uh, you know, it helps keep it timeless. And, you know, I think that's kind of, I mean, you asked where my innovation is, is like, not that that's innovation, but it's definitely a goal of mine is kind of just hunting for the timeless, you know, and, you know, building stuff that still perform well, but then you can pass it on to your grandkids later one day, hopefully, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff in my lineup too. That is high performance, like my Carrera models and stuff like that, but they're riding that pipeline and you don't know that. Those things are going to fall apart. They're weight sensitive. I can't have them too heavy. So you can't put a lot of the pigment glass jobs in them, you know, and they're going to turn yellow. They're going to look like shit in six years, five years, whatever, like most performance boards do anyway. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, for instance, uh, I was speaking with uh, Eric Arakawa uh, a few, mm -hmm. few months Great ago. Shaper. Amazing. And uh, also amazing person. And uh, uh, he told me about all the research that he's putting on uh, new materials and saying that, uh, in effect, he would like to have uh, uh, different materials, different approach, different technologies, but uh, the cost of innovation is quite high and end up with a huge cost to the, uh, to the consumer. So he said, like, I, I yeah. would like really to innovate, but at a certain point, we need to face the, the final client, right? And the price. Yeah, but you look at the people that, you know, like, you look at Grubby Clark, what he invented back in the 60s, and we're still using it today. Those are, like, the real pioneers, real innovators. And, you know, there is this push, especially now with all things being environmentally sensitive and health sensitive and all that, which I love. But, you know, it, it's every. I'm done being the guinea pig, you know, like when Clark foam went out, we had so much stuff thrown at us like, Hey, this blanks made from sugar. This blanks made mm. from tree sap. <laughs> this made from kelp and algae and all this. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, and then they, you know, you know, they bring their stuff over and the environmental, this environmental, that I'm like, all right, cool. Well, it's still gotta be a fucking good surfboard. Look good. And ride good. And the shit just, all that stuff fell apart, you know? So I'm like, I'm, you know, and I'm not a big company, so I don't have time to be the guinea pig for all that. And then you get these guys. Uh, I have these guys from NASA, right? And they, they, you know, they're just walking around like they're the shit. They're NASA. And I'm like, you know, they heard about me. And they thought I'd be a good guinea pig to promote their product because they knew, you know, I was doing good quality stuff and glassing. with because I don't mean my glass too. So they brought their resin to me. And, you know, right away, they're just swinging their dicks out. We're from NASA. We invented this resin. You're 
you know, you should try this. This is going to change the world of surfing and it's water based. And no, 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 no. Like, oh, yeah, I understand. It's so safe for me. I opened the can, snipped it, I almost fucking <laughs> passed out. And I'm like, this is water based and safe here. I almost fucking threw up. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> and, I, and, and then and then they wanted me to sign a non-disclosure agreement and all this i'm like dude i'm not signing shit man i go are you gonna pay me if these things are in my blanks i go i'll try it but if it destroys some you owe me money <laughs> <laughs> you know maybe it was it was safe for the yeah, rest of the right world. away right away yeah so my laminator gun does it he starts getting dizzy and high he had to go home work early calls me up he's like dude i got a rash on my arm from that shit i'm not touching it again <laughs> I'm like, oh, sorry. And this is on a Friday. I go back Monday and the whole fucking blank dissolved. Oh my God. I call the guys. I'm like, get your shit and your NASA cocky ass <laughs> out of here, dude. <laughs> Never saw those guys again. And they, they swore they were going to change the world. Sir. So there's just so much stuff like that, you know? It's just like, like, and you know, everyone's environmentally sensitive. And, you know, I, I am too. I want all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you want, like I tell people, you want an environmentally friendly surfboard, like, it's got to pass my three tests. Like, A, it's most importantly, it's got to work. And B, it's got to look good. You know, surfers like things that look bitch. And, and C, it's got to last. Yeah. And, you know, I see all these things like these epoxy this and epoxy that, but they look like shit in two years. They're, they're sensitive on how they ride and when they ride. And you lay them out in the sun and they fucking blow up. So it's like, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're Phil Edwards. Your 1964 Phil Edwards is the most environmentally friendly surfboard there is because that Plus, thing ain't ever going to end up in the landfill, right? Like it's no. going to be just around forever and it's only going to go up in value. Of course. <laughs> um, all this other shits in the landfill. The problem with, you know, everyone's brainwashed on epoxies being more environmentally friendly, but the problem is the blanks, the, the, that, the, it's just a, the beer, you know, those nine, those $2 beer coolers you buy at 7-Eleven, you know, when you forgot your cooler and you go on the beach. That's all the foam is on EPS. And it's no different than a rubber tire. You bury it in the dirt and dig it up 500 years from now and it's still going to be there. At least with the polyester brakes, they break down. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I can't put any of that dust in my coffee and drink it. So, you know, like eat the shit, it ain't environmentally friendly. I, mean, I wish it was, but I'm not going to be the guinea pig and I don't think anyone else should either. And I, I honestly, like, I don't see anything changing drastically for at least 10 years. The, the biggest changes are going to be the new environmental laws. Like I'm afraid of California and I love that California is sensitive. Like California is a harder place to build a surfboard period because we have really strict regulations and all that. So my biggest fear is one day, you know, we got such these aggressive governments now is one day all of a sudden they like pass some bill. I'm like, polyester resins banned. Mm. And we can't go out surfboards no more <laughs> <laughs> like that. And pretty soon the shaping machines are going to be so sophisticated where it's just going to be, I'm saying within five years on this, it's going to be a push of the button. That board is shaped. Yeah. But people are still going to want something handmade anyways. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Definitely. I'm, I'm among the people that wants always the uh, end shape, but nevertheless, it's, <laughs> it's fun. What you said about the resin, you know, they wanted to maybe to change the whole uh, surf industry while, evaporating every single surfboard yeah. <laughs> yeah. these guys these guys claim they make rockets man i'm glad i didn't go into any rocket they made <laughs> cool uh, let's talk to, uh we are almost at the end of our interview let's talk about you as a surfer what is your favorite uh surfboard to, to surf uh, like we have like a, a one that uh like you like more than the others or no, I, I like all of them. I'm like real, you know, I, I'm into so much shit. Like, obviously, if you look at my the, my lineup on my surfboards, it's, you know, obviously from 5.0 fish, 11 foot guns to Chris Crafts. It, like, I ride, I like to ride all kinds of different things. I, I'm involved in a lot of different sports. Um, for me, it's just feeling. Um, I live in North County, San Diego, so there's a lot of terrain. You know, in the summertime, our waves get really slopey, but super clean. Um, so I ride a lot of, you know, obviously like fish inspired type of boards to the Chris crafts, which is like, you know, the big board skip fry Eagle style. And then in the winter time we get really good waves. So then, you know, I, anywhere from a standard Carrera to regular performance thruster to, I like playing around with bonzers when there's good surf. Um, so it just depends on my mood. I mean, I'm into so many different things. So I, I think that's been 
good translating that into surfing. You know, I'm super into motocross. I, I drag race my car really into snowboarding, golf, all kinds of sports. So it's healthy not to, in all things, you know, that's a pigeonhole yourself in just the one thing or just, you know, you get involved in something more 80%. It's an obsession, you know, I don't try to be obsessed with any one thing at all. I agree with you. Do you have uh, any project like future project or which you're working on something that you really would like to realize or you're, what's, what's that? Or is still secret you don't want to share? No, nothing secret. Um, you know, actually, like I said, I'm actually enjoying shaping more than I've ever been. You know, I'm 48 years old now. Um, obviously, the model of my business changed from like, you know, I started in 1992. And from 1992 to 2002, everything was hand shaped. Did a lot of production shapes for Rusty and, you know, Dick Brewer and myself. I worked for Sharp Eye, uh, GNS, a uh, handful of companies. And, you know, I, those are great because I learned how to make a lot of boards at once, hand shaping. And, and then obviously then the machine came and, you know, I got more and more orders. But anyways, now I'm getting excited again about doing more hand shaping. Obviously, I can't, um, I don't think I'm going to take too many custom orders for hand shaping. And I'm kind of going to do it just kind of on my watch and when I want to. And then just do a post on Instagram, kind of Banksy style, like, hey, I just hand shape these five, show a few pictures of it, first come, first serve, and, you know, give a little story about them. So I think on the social media, people start seeing that a little more. That's kind of my goal for next year is to do some more of that, kind of take a step back. And, and uh, cause I still love hand shaping. I'm, I probably got, I know I got over 20, close to 20, yeah, right around 20,000 hand shapes under my belt. So wow. I've cut, I've cut my teeth with the planer. Some people are like, Hey, you're using the machine now and all, all this stuff. You know, so many people get so sensitive over this hand shape or machine shape and all this shit. Like I, I do, I, I, you know, my brand's doing almost a hundred boards a week right now. Like I got two skinny arms. Like, what am I going to fucking do? <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, I still do like hand shaping. And, and then one thing I want to have, you know, I've seen on social media, especially like Ryan Lovelace stuff and all that, these people that, you know, like claim and the hand shapes only and Ryan's a great shaper. And it's cool that he can, he has, I like how he's doing this, you know, his hand shaping. And then for his machine shapes, he has the other labels, which is great and all. And a lot of people ask me the difference. And I was actually at the Grateful Dead concert last week in San Diego. And, Somehow I started thinking about shaping while I was at the concert. I don't know why, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but it gave me the analogy. It's like, all right, what's the difference between a hand shape and a machine shape? And for me, is the hand shapes live music. The machine shapes, you know, the studio recorded vision version. Yeah. Now, now here's the good thing, right? So there's a lot of bands out there that, you know, they sound good on you know, the studio. <laughs> on, in studio on CD on an album. But if they're really not that talented live, they're going to be awful, right? Yeah. And I think the same goes for shaping. You know, there's a lot of guys that, oh, yeah, yeah, the machine shape looks pretty good. Their Instagram's cute. And, yeah. You know, oh, their glass jobs are groovy. But as soon as you throw a planer in there, you know, it's like, oh, man. Mm-hmm. Okay. So <laughs> we, 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 I mean, like, you know, I mean, like glass, and we get a lot of international shapers that want to come by and da 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 da, you know, and I, and I only know them from afar from what I see on their Instagram. I'm like, oh, this guy's kind of groovy, huh? All right. Da, da, da. And he goes, yeah, I'm a, da, da, da. you know, and like you bring all the orders and I got a shaping room for the gas. And there's been some guys, not saying names, obviously, but <laughs> there's been some guys that's like, whoa, okay. And then, and then, you know, they're like, oh, the machine shop's slow. I go, well, fucking use a planer. Oh, I got to, I will use a planer. Oh, I don't know that. Use a planer. And, <laughs> They turn the planer on. I'm like, yeah, you you shouldn't go on stage, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> is the is not as good as the live live. Uh, no. Yeah, and, so that's my analogy. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, nothing wrong with a good recording, right? I mean, I love Rolling Stones on vinyl. Good but in person, they're even and they're even that much better, you know. So. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, you know, they all, always sound better in live, uh, but you know, like if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, um, Exile on, Exile on the Main Street in, uh, recording. Oh man, that's, 
Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> if you think about it, you know, like, uh, and how it was recorded in the, uh, in this castle in France on the, on the, on the lower ground. Yeah. I think, you know, all that recording, for instance, was art piece by itself, right? So. Yeah. And it's all in two channel. And, and, you know, it's amazing about that era too. And the same for the shapers. And there's no blueprint, right? Like there's no social media. There's no Google, no YouTube, no internet, da, 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 da. And you know, look how much creative, more creative people were back then. And that goes back in, you know, when I say I was designing new models and all that stuff is like, I'm like, I want to just turn it all off. I don't want to be influenced. And I feel like you get the best stuff. And nowadays, like everyone's got the blueprint right in front of them, just on their phones and the internet and all that. And I think it's really stymied um, the music industry, the art industry, so many things, you know, it's really stymied creativity and uh in these newer generations that's just my stubborn generation x opinion <laughs> <laughs> no no i completely agree with you uh, and um, you know we we were talking about the the boardroom show at the beginning of the interview and that definitely you know everything is in shape at least on the competition right so, yeah so that's the uh, if you if you are part of that, you know, look at the other ones, right? It's a totally different. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be invited into that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Okay. I can imagine. Um, we're gonna finish our interview with a short Q and A session. So please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind. I ask the same question okay. to everybody on this show. So, <laughs> okay, the best surfboard that you ever ridden. Okay, best or whatever written. I guess I gotta answer them quickly. <laughs> Five A skip fry kill fish. Well, I guess uh, 1995. Legendary one, right? So it's yeah. A, um your uh, favorite um shaper today. Skip fry. Skip fry. Uh personal question, your favorite song. Weather uh it's is it Weather Sweet Report by Bob Weir. Okay. Um, your favorite surf spot? Actually, you just home in Cardiff. Yeah, <laughs> there is no other place than home. Better place than home. No place, place like home. Uh, no place like home. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your favorite surfer of all time? Tom Curran. Definitely. And the last question is a little bit unusual. I ask everybody again on this show. It has nothing to do with surf or shaping. I <laughs> like to know your best relationship advice best relationship <laughs> advice <laughs> i ask everybody i even ask greg no <laughs> oh man i should have listened to that one. <laughs> oh man patience patience right super important in everything right yeah. in shaping as well yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. thanks a lot chris for being with me on the show today and i look forward thanks to so much. you very very soon Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo! Mahalo!